Welcome to Star Wars Season 3 Rebels Thoughts. So, spoilers for everything Star Wars leading up to and including this season. And yeah, I continue to love every single episode of this show so far. This video is going to be my riffs and analysis for the season, not a review. I will do a spoiler free review once I've watched all four seasons. Since I won't get into the following in every single episode section in this video, I will just briefly say every episode so far has great creativity and designs. The action is engaging, varied, well choreographed. I'm invested in the stories and characters. Anything I don't comment on, pursue my approval of. Not that this is only going to be negative. And I will be talking about the messages it communicates, in part about fascism since Star Wars was, in part about criticizing fascism from the very start. So, diving headfirst into the season opener, The Siege of Lothal, Part 1. So, when I take in written reviews of the show, I have it read to me by the TTS reader, and it pronounces Grand Admiral Thrawn as Grandad Meral Thrawn, which made me chuckle every time. You might take one look at Ezra's head and suspect he had a haircut. This is incorrect. He actually had them all cut. Ezra has been on a roll with good plans recently. We learned later in the episode it's because of the Sith holocron, so he's going further down that path since last season. Always loves seeing Hondo. He wants to sell the Mandalorian gun until he changes his mind and wants to keep it. Ezra has made a new lightsaber, it's green instead of blue, so they're doing the OT thing of green saber means that you might turn to the dark side, while red is pure evil, blue is pure good. Poor Ognaught. Ezra uses mind control to get the ATST to shoot stormtroopers and then take a long walk off a short pier. Here and argue here and Ezra argue over the mission failure. We see that Ezra continues to communicate with the Sith Holocron. I will never let my friends get hurt again. So, very similar to how Anakin Skywalker turned into Darth Vader. So far, I'm liking this better than how the prequels, prequel movies handled it. And, yeah, you know, you can really understand. Like, he did lose the, the you know, um, yeah, Kanan lost his regular eyesight, at least. And Ahsoka was lost. Now, yeah, and, you know, we learn they may be able to get a squadron of Y-Wings, which would definitely, you know, help a lot. It does not take Kanan long to stumble across the Sith Holocron. I'm, you know, I was a little worried that, oh, are they going to do a whole thing? Like, it starts as the basic sitcom thing with, you know, oh, the, oh, um, please don't come in just yet. And no, no, no I'm just, it's not going to, you know. And he's almost touchy. I I thought, oh, they're gonna take, they're gonna do this for freaking ever. You know, they're gonna drag this out over several episodes. But no, like within a minute of entering Ezra's room, he finds it. So, and they argue, and he leaves with it, which makes a lot of sense. And Kanan comes across a giant creature that identifies itself as a Bendu. Love the design, just. So just the 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 eyes and the 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 fact that it basically does feel like it is part of nature, which we've always been told the force is. You know, it's not some like weird special thing. It's just that not everyone can manipulate it, but it's part of nature. And we learn that Thrawn killed many civilians to take out a few rebels, relatively speaking, and doesn't feel bad about it. Feels that it was the right thing to do. So, great bit of characterization there. Ezra insists they go after the Y-Wings now, even though their mission was recon. Very tense ending. Which brings us to the second episode, The Siege of Lothal Part 2. The dismantler droid causes severe damage. Fighting rebel cells? Costly. Losing Governor Price? Priceless. Hondo says every situation has the possibility of profit and claims they're going to liberate the Ognaughts. 
and the Bendu is teaching Kanan to use his other senses. I appreciate they don't go Daredevil with it. Man, that spider got close. Very cool fights between Sabine and the Dismantler Droid, and then Rex and the Dismantler Droid. He got the power! And the Y-Wings have no hyperdrives anymore, just in case they were recovered by Rebels. Very clever. You know, the, the Empire is thorough. That's, yeah. We learn Thrawn has a big plan. And Hera suspends Ezra's command, which makes a lot of sense. Let's see. Episode 3, The Lost Commanders. Maul is still obsessed with revenge on Obi-Wan so many years later. The dark side, indeed. I really appreciate, like, this, you know, over the course of these... You know, both both Clone Wars and this, we really see, like, it's such destructive. Like, I don't blame him for not being able to forgive Obi-Wan, but it's very clear, like, sure, like, in the short term, he enjoyed more power, but in the long term, Maul was destroyed by his hatred of Obi-Wan. You know, if he had... If he were able to let it go and move on to something else something constructive, you know, in, yeah, maybe he would still, maybe he would have survived this season. And Maul becomes very frustrated when he can't solve the Jedi Rubik's Cube. Great fight between Maul and the crew. Maul is very verbally cruel to Kanan and Ezra, for referring to the latter as his young apprentice. And Maul shoves Kanan into the airlock. Hero said earlier to Maul, it's at the bottom in case you want to leave, which told him where it was and put the idea in the audience's head that someone might go through there. And the holocrons are successfully opened. And that brings us to episode four, Relics of the Old Republic. I appreciate the, de the detail that it has to be Sabine, not Ezra, posing as a student, since, as they point out, I was going to say, if they didn't in this video, they already know what Ezra looks like. He can't go undercover without altering his appearance or something. And then you have the detail that Sabine used to be a student, so she knows some of the stuff. And we meet Wedge Antilles. Normally I'm against the kind of fake out where it looks like someone is hurt or dies, and then it turns out to be a simulation, and they even cut to commercials on this one. Yeah, I. it wasn't necessary to... Anyway. Yet again, torture is shown to be a tool of evil, though they do also say that it works. But then the Empire lies about a lot of things, as fascists are wont to. Great fight between Sabine and the Imperial officer. We were coming to rescue. That's cute. Love it. And Cal's help says they should tell Zeb they're even... So was he kidding about that, or did he decide after this episode that he was going to continue helping them? Anyway. Episode... Uh, yeah, episode five. Always two. There are. Love seeing Cham Syndulla again. Hero poses as a hostage. Ezra as the trooper. Very sweet when Hera finds the Calicuri. Ultimately, she ends the episode without it, but she finds a way to not feel like she's missing it. And Thrawn. Thrawn is there. He's why Cham has been struggling against Empire Tactics recently. And catches Hera, knows about the Caligari, realized Ezra would be nearby, and actually gets angry at the officer about the art, and is impressed Hera found a way out of the situation, doesn't pursue her, really loving his characterization. And that brings us to episode 6, Brothers of the Broken Horn. Battles leave scars, some of them you can't see. And later in the episode, he has a PTSD flashback, seeing Battle Droid from the Commander. Kanan has to talk, you know, he thinks that the Clone War is still going. Kanan has to talk him down. It's hard for me to put words to how much I appreciate this honest and empathetic depiction of PTSD. A commander super battle droid. They're highly intelligent. They're actually capable of appreciating the comedic genius of Rick and Morty. And the Separatist commander wants to play a war game. Because he feels a need to prove that his side 
is superior tactically. I am not programmed to understand your humor. Ha ha ha. Really loving seeing such a great display of tactics. This time, no ray shield. The only shield is going to be Brook. And every move you make, every step you take. And through Ezra, the episode points out sometimes in a battle between two sides is actually a third party that's victorious. For example, both sides may be weakened. Germany lost World War I, but the Nazis were able to gain a lot of power afterwards. Ezra can't imagine fighting so many battle droids all the time. Rex brings up Genosis and bore E with his war stories. And... <coughs> That brings us to episode seven wings of the master. Turn around, bright eyes. It's complicated, then uncomplicated. I was legitimately shocked when Rao actually flew away from them, leaving them there. I continue to really love Mandalorian action. Super cool when they're all flying, Ezra's hanging from Sabine. Sabine's hand deflecting blaster bolts with a lightsaber. You know, it really is no wonder that they ended up making a show specifically about Mandalorian. Just, yeah. Rao does rescue them and even join. And that brings us to episode 8. Blood Sisters are doing it for themselves. We learn that Sato's nephew and his crew are, act are especially rebe rebellious rebels. I need your help throwing out my old Betamax types. Throne shows up in his Star Destroyer. I really like how this episode builds to this part. Like, Mart keeps thinking that he's up against the Star Destroyer. Sabine keeps telling him he's wrong about that. Until eventually they are looking at a Star Destroyer. And he they all feel unprepared. Episode 9, Stealth Strike. More Hondo. Also, more as Morrigan. Hondo makes two unintentional jokes at the expense of Kanan's blindness, but does apologize after each one, so it could increase empathy in young audiences for not making extensive jokes. AP5 tells them the odds. We get another creepy abandoned ship. Love it. I've, I, you know, if there's one thing that this show never gets wrong, it's when they're you know, when they're examining a creepy abandoned ship or, like, what's it called? Like a facility or something. That's, yeah, love it every time. Melchie the Ugnaught. Hondo agrees to raise his percentage from 1% to 2%, and he's ecstatic. I was on TV. Part of the truth is better than none of the truth, which is what you used to get. So do not tell me that I have not grown as a person. Love Hondo. Just absolutely love him. Very creepy when Zeb is taken out by a droid we barely see. I really appreciate when, like, filmmakers and, and animators and such, when they acknowledge, no, 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 look, kids can handle some creepy, scary stuff. You just can't, you know, don't push it too far. Don't show them the thing 1982, but, like... No, kids can handle, you know, like, watch it again if you if you don't remember. It's legitimately very, very nicely creepy. Yeah, great reveal on the droid as Morgan temporarily takes it out and then the rest of the droids attack. I like the thing with, you know, it would be problematic. The reason it would be problematic is because if one is attacked, then that sends the signal to all of them. And because Ezra cut a hole in the door, they can continue to attack. Very exciting escape. Melty hidden the treasure chest. Hondo evidently does not believe that the real treasure is the friends you made along the way. Which brings us to episode 10, The Future of the Force. I don't have any factory experience, and it'll fit right in. And Thrawn forces Ezra's old friend to demonstrate the speed. Let's see. On the, yeah, that's speeder that he built. 
since both of them knows it'll explode and he won't let them jump off once it's clear it's going to explode and he says from now on they will be forced to personally test what they make and Governor Price smiles at the explosion reminds me of the smile of Chief Guard Barnes when Alex is I suppose let's just say he's being tempted and it's not working fascism disposes of anyone that they don't deem useful or worthy and you know I realize you know they would say oh but you know we've lost the the you know people have died because of these badly made yeah but you know you're killing civilians as you know an earlier episode established Thrawn is happy to kill civilians even if there are more civilians dead than rebels so he doesn't have exactly have the moral high ground here Thrawn asks the officer about the artwork the officer merely notes it appears to be from the, the that wall Callus does realize what it is, and the officer, you can see from his body language, is frustrated that he didn't know. Fascism privileges the powerful few to know details about their enemies. If you aren't a, of a high enough status and you know details about the enemies that isn't part of propaganda, you will be suspected of working with the enemy. And it goes to commercial when Callus reveals he knows that the two guards are rebels, and then after he reveals himself to be to be fulcrum right after the outbreak. It's clever because he didn't actually threaten them. He just made it clear he knew they were rebels. Now, if he continues the facade, he cannot help them. And we did see him start to think deeply about the situation after he and Zeb were stuck on the ice moon. Ezra telekinesis throws Callus, and the only reason Kanan is upset about it is that he wanted to be the one to do it. Sabotage, especially of weaponry, is a very important part of resistance movements during fascist rule. This episode really reminds me of the, the train derailments that some resistance movements were able to cause in occupied countries during World War II. Not to mention, of course, Oscar Schindler, who famously made weapons that did not work, and hired as many Jews as he could so that they would not be forced to go to concentration camps. And while Schindler's List is an amazing movie, I would not show it to the children that this show is at least partially aimed at until they're a little older and can handle the viciousness of the Nazis that the film shows so well. I like the change exchange. Throne tends to turn the spy into an asset. We wonder if he already knows Callus is the spy. Certainly seems very possible from the way he talks to Callus here at the end. And he does later realize that, you know, later in the season, he's 100% certain. And right. Episode 11, Legacy. A bunch of dogs trying to help it. Ezra is seeing Maul everywhere, even attacked a rebel person. I want to stop seeing Maul. How do I turn him down gently? And I like the don't turn around. The spirits are appropriately creepy. Sabine, it's Ezra. She knows. Why do you think she's shooting? So rebels temporarily became evil dead rebels. Love it. Episode 12, A Princess on Lethal. It's worth taking a closer look. Sounds good. You contact Seth, My Seth Myers. I'll contact Henry. Rex saw saw, and then the other see saw, and the character is now voiced by Forrest Whitaker, who played the part in Rogue One, and they even added his IRL left eye ptosis. To be continued. Yeah. And episode thirteen, the Protector of Concord Dawn. The crew see how extreme Saw is, and Saw blames the Geonosians for his sister's death, so now that he has power over a Geonosian, he's treating it as badly as he can get away with. Reminds me of Israel versus Gaza. Of course the Israelis, who should not be confused for all Jewish people, have a reason to hate Middle Eastern Muslims, but how they're treating the Palestinians is not in order to protect themselves, it's to get revenge. It's cruelty. And, and to be clear, you know, I'm not saying that there's something inherently wrong with Jewish people or Israelis. You know, I, I blame 
the people who voted for Netanyahu. And 100%, it makes sense that they should have a country of their own. After, you know, them lacking a home country for so long, you know, that's part of why they had to travel around and, and you know, try to, yeah, try to find other places, and they would routinely get persecuted, even though there was no place to go where they wouldn't be persecuted. And we learned that Click Clack just wanted to protect his egg. Headed to the central air. Shaft. Sand. It gets everywhere. I see what you did there. Then you're no better than the Empire. Love that exchange. That just perfect. We the viewer know that it was the Death Star being built on Genosis, so when Saul says he hopes when they find out what it is isn't too late, we know that he doesn't live to see it destroyed, but he doesn't he does however, play a very important role in destroying it. You know, if not for him, the the pilot I so many characters in that movie, and only in that, you know, that don't appear in other, I, I do not recall his name, but the, yeah, you know, he, he checks the, the pilot, and the pilot gets, you know, joins the other rebels, and, yeah, if, if not for the pilot, they wouldn't have been able to destroy. So I will have it momentarily. Riz Ahmed's character, Bodhi Rook. Hero points out to Ezra, they're not in a position to turn away, turn away allies, even if they are extreme. And Saw did prove he was better than the Empire. And it is, it is very true. You know, there are some... Um, resistance movements that have been forced to work with people that they really thought, okay, this is just, this is too extreme, but, you know, they need all the help they can get. Episode 14, Legends of Philosophy. But yeah, I really appreciate that they did, you know, no, he did prove he's better than the Empire. I love AP5 and Chopper roasting Zeb. I like all the jokes about doing inventory. AP5 feels like it's important. Zeb and Chopper don't want to help. And the Imperial droid does in a few seconds. AP5 won't admit that that's more than what he could do. And they learn too late that the Imperial droid is Imperial and dangerous. Knows, you know, Now knows the location of the Rebel base. All the weapons they have. Dozens of cases of explosives. That could be enough for Sabine for one, maybe even two episodes. If it leaks, we can track it. They realize it's going to blow up. It even gets a very Predator countdown, but they're able to set it to blow up the Imperial base instead. AP5 and Zeb almost start liking and respecting each other, but they agree. That's just too much for one day. Callus smiles at realizing... Let's see... that Yeah, that they managed to blow up the ship, and congratulations. It's a long story, and one I can recount in excruciating detail, and Zeb blocks the mouth. I mean, it probably doesn't make sense that Zeb could keep AP5 from talking by covering the mouth area. Like, of course it's going to work on a person, you're covering the mouth, but the droid doesn't have a biological mouth, so it's, yeah. But it's still kind of a funny joke. Thrawn says he has narrowed his search for rebel bases, even though the specific droid was destroyed. I really appreciate, like, at the end of this season, he has indeed tracked them down. You know, it's he basically spends the entire season, sometimes off-screen, working his way to finding their base so that he can attack it in the season finale. And, you know, he reaches it, attacks it. Yeah. Let's see. They talk uh, right. Episode fifteen, the call. If I could, I never would. So yeah, they talk about the possibility of Sabine leading an army of Mandalorians for the rebels, which is of course very. That would be extremely useful. Sabine is very aggressive this episode because of the pain from thinking about her past. I, you know, 
it feels like a natural kind of, you know, she's always, you know, Ezra said earlier, she's kind of a, or is it this, episode? anyway, he says an ep in an episode that she's kind of a loner. Yeah, that was last season, I think. Anyway, you know, yeah, she can, she can sometimes be, you know, aggressive. And here it's especially, and it's because she's been carrying this pain for all this time. It's just here, it really comes up to the surface. At first, the saber training does not go well. Hira convinces Kanan to let Sabine use the dark saber. Kanan provokes Sabine. She admits what really happened in the past. And episode 16, Homecoming. Followed up by Far From Home and No Way Home. They speak the Mandalorian tongue. Very cool to hear. They're shooting because they know it's Sabine. Fan sees Gar Saxon talk with Sabine's mother. We lost everything. Our honor, our respect, our clownlessness. Gar Saxon betrays the entire Ren family. And Fan Rao gets them back their lightsabers. And now they have a fighting chance. Very cool when Gar Saxon and Sabine fight. You know, all the way, but especially when they get to the ice. And they do the fake out where it looks like Gar Saxon shoots Sabine, but it was really her mother shooting him. It was kind of cool. With Gar Saxon dead, there will be chaos. It seems like they're not even considering a weekend at Bernie's solution. And Sabine is going to stay on Mandalore until she finds a leader for the people. Which I really appreciate, because, like... That has consequences for the finale. And that brings us to episode 17, The Honorable Ones. We open on Callus' certain point of view. Very cool stylistic choice. Ezra is there to free Callus. AP5 and Chopper pretend to have been liberated from the rebels by the Empire. Now, the episode does end without Callus joining the rebels, so it might appear to basically be filler... But it is also the episode where the base planet is removed from the plans in Thrawn's office, where Thrawn becomes convinced that Callus is the spy. I love the gravity when we learn that Thrawn is nearby. He's not a rebel, he's a bounty hunter. He's from Lothal. That's enough. Because fascism doesn't care about the truth so much as apparent results. If they didn't bring Ezra, then they would be accused of working for the enemy, even though they have no real evidence. Thrawn fights assassin droids just to stay in shape, and later Callus turns them against him, even turning off the override code since he overheard it. Great bit of, like, when we just see him fighting them, like, you know, at the time I was just like, holy crap, that's intense. I wasn't thinking, ah, that's gonna be, you know, I know, some people probably did figure it out, that they're going to be turned against him later in the episode. This is an episode with a lot of tension and suspense, but I especially love when they're hiding in Thrawn's office and he arrives. And Governor Price knows that the stormtroopers on the transport must be rebels, so just, yeah. And, yeah, it appears Lieutenant List was the spy... But Thrawn realizes that can't be. And and I think yeah, yeah, and and knows that it's the it's in actuality callous. Which brings us to episode 18, Shroud of Darkness. Very cool to see Mon Mothma. Tense episode, especially when they're hiding with the power off and they're chasing it and Dealing with the heat. We're caught in a tractor beam. We can't break free. Excellent message from Mon Mothma. Very cool ending. Which brings us to episode 19. The Forgotten Droid. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to imply that you shouldn't be the leader. I don't want to attack your obviously frail ego. Have I said recently how much I love AP5? Because it's it's like, it's a lot. When AP5 verbatim said, anything you can do, I can do better, 
I thought, ah, oh, yeah, cute little joke. You know, the, the kids are definitely going to get that one. But then they actually do the whole video. You know, Chopper says, um, no, you can't. And, and AP5 says, yes, I can. They do it, the, I think it's three times and then move on. Just, yeah. So I know the words, there were words in between them, but one of the characters in this episode actually did say, resistance is futile. So that's, yeah, appreciate. Shopper starts being polite to them, which obviously raises red flags. While it is, of course, understandable that Wedge is frustrated that EP5 follows him when he says, I need to refresh, let's keep in mind that to a droid refresh just means pressing F5. You don't need privacy for that. Open the cargo bay doors, shop. Sure thing, Dame. Dave, I'm gonna let you do that. Oh, um. And the Imperial uses shop to attack AP5. A lot of folks did call him Two Gun Shopper, but that wasn't because he was sporting two pistols. And Zeb Zaps Shopper says he's been wanting to do it for a long time, and I believe him. Hira appears on the monitor, chews out the guy at the control panel, and blows up the place with him still inside. This scene was directly based on the nightmares of the Phantom Menace. And AP5 goes, I was happy in space looking at the stars. He starts singing and he wants to stay out there. And there's like, he's like imagining, I mean, they kind of looked like birds. Just, yeah, that was, that was really funny. And that brings us to episode 20, The Mystery of Shopper Base. Ezra, can I have a word with you? Several, if possible. The voice for Obi-Wan, or should I say Ben, is an excellent impersonation of Alec Guinness. Very nice little... I mean, I realize, you know, that was the... the um, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. I love the actor. Um, I'll have it momentarily. Ewan McGregor was also basing his performance heavily on Alec Guinness, but he wasn't trying to sound exactly like him, which this voice actor is, and he does an incredible job. Excellent fight between Ben and Maul. I really like that Maul tries to use the move that won the fight against Qui-Gon, and Ben was ready for him to do that. Maul was trying to, you know, he... he you know, yeah, he's, he's got both hands on the, the saber in the middle part, He's trying to, to use it to knock him in the forehead, you know, and he would then have followed that up by the stab through the gut. And instead, Ben cuts through the middle, which which is also something, you know, he did... Didn't he do it? Ah, oh, crap. It's been a while since I watched that fight. I feel like he did also cut through the middle of the, the hilt in their, their fight in the movie. But, but yeah, you know, and wounds him by, like, I think it's the torso that, yeah. Some people dislike that the fight between Maul and Obi-Wan was very short. Uh, Dave Filoni himself has explained it's in part an homage to the samurai, samurai movies that inspired Jedi and lightsabers in the first place, and extremely skilled fighters end fights very, very quickly, which does make a lot of sense. You know, it's cool to watch a fight, but if you're in a fight to the death, like, you don't want it to last a really long time because the longer it lasts the greater chance you'll lose and die and that brings us to episode 21 Twilight of the Apprentice part 1 Thrawn catches Callus and they fight you talk too much it's a villain thing you used to know you have the heart of a rebel I want it back it was very clearly marked in the refrigerator. And later it's clear that Callus has in between in, in the meantime been actually beaten to get him, you know, to break his spirit. Really, really cool tense escape for Ezra and you know the the idea of preventing use of hyperspace, like holy crap, that's yeah. And Bendu refuses to join, so Ka Kanan you know, taunts him. And that brings us to the season finale. Excellent season finale. Twilight of the Apprentice Part 2. I, actually, I guess both are the finale. Anyway, very tense with the, the shield. 
and some Mandalorians do join, and they do they you know they manage to take out some ATSTs with with you know remote detonated mines, and and Zeb gets to blow one up with the the rocket launcher, but then the AT AT the yeah the AT ATs arrive and not gonna work quite as well. Really cool when when. Kanan, like, saber some of the legs. And Bendu, you know, creates a massive firestorm. So, we're definitely dealing with some, some Tiberian Sun territory here. Very, very cool. And I really appreciate the detail. You know, he says, I am beyond your ability to destroy, you know. Ah, uh, looks like it to me. You cannot see, but I can. And I really enjoyed Callus taunting the, the Imperials. And of course, it was so he would end up alone with two stormtroopers. And, you know, he, yeah, he easily takes them out off screen and gets into an escape pod. And, yeah. Really, really love this this season finale. I really appreciate that. Yeah, you know, after so much of this season, you know, is thrown inching ever closer, and the finale, he actually get he reaches, you know, he dis he's discovered the base, he reaches it, and he attacks it. You know, very, very cool. So, yeah, um, whether we're talking. The overall season, the season opener, the season finale, I continue to feel like these animated Star Wars things just get better and better, you know, so I love them all, starting with The Clone Wars Season 1 and ending with Rebels Season 3, just, yeah, they just keep getting better and better, really, really cool, really happy that this is the case, and let's see, there we go, so, yeah, um, now let's see, next season is 16 episodes, so yeah, I expect to do the video on the next season in one week, because that's, you know, that's two episodes per day, and slightly more, uh, you know, so, so yeah. The, um, let's see, yeah, really, really psyched to see how the, the, the show ends, and... Yeah, been really, really happy with all that has, you know, the the arcs and character growth that we've seen so far. So, yeah, that is it for this one. May the Force be with you.